Good morning, chaps. So, today's video is going to be on the Vickers Mark IV, the Valiant, the third vehicle made by Vickers with that name, and a vehicle that resonates with the first of its name as it was never put into production. Designed from the outset as an export platform, it was never intended to replace Chieftain, and despite having some good features for its time, was cursed by design, although aspects of it would go on to other vehicles. The Vickers Mark IV was first referenced in 1976, with some of the earliest surviving documents under inquiry number NE9012. In this, they draw parallels between the FV4211 concept tank, a chieftain with early chopper armor, and a new proposal Vickers were working on. The new tank was to weigh 42.6 tons loaded and 35.6 tons empty, making it considerably lighter than many current vehicles, but would have superior protection. This in tank design is no easy feat. Protection increases with weight loss being very difficult to achieve. To do this, they would use an all aluminium endoskeleton on the hull with chop and packs, and a steel turret with modular chop and packs on the outside. Other features to save weight were a relatively compact design, as well as aluminium road wheels. With a naked weight of 35 tonnes, the armour was designed for easy attachment and removal on and off the battlefield, with each piece to be liftable by two men so that the tank could be effectively stripped down for transport or to fit inside the NATO B-21 rail gauge. As well as the opportunity to be defrocked in peacetime, thus making training and everyday use less logistically intensive. Protection was centred on the front 50 to 60 degrees, with the thickest chobham over the lower hull and the turret front, both which presented the greatest area to enemy fire. These blocks were also made in such a way as to protect other areas. For example, two small blocks of chobham were to be mounted onto the front of the panniers to protect the crew from attack to the front wheels. The sides were also protected against attacks, but more so from light anti-tank weapons and not tank guns. These extended as far back as the engine compartment bulkhead, but only that far. The blocks behind this were in fact dummy blocks used as a disguise and were hollow boxes. This is also true of the turret side armour, which extended as far back as the commander's position with the rearmost boxes being empty. This was to save weight overall. The turret armour on the front was made to overlap the side armour to prevent shots striking the side packs perpendicularly where the chobham would have little effect. A wooden mock-up model was made and the base protection levels were mapped out. At this stage she was still armed with just a British gun and was very angular in shape. Plans were drawn and showed the following protection levels. Over the frontal arc of 50 degrees, the turret was immune to 105mm APDS. Over the frontal arc of 60 degrees, the hull is immune to 125mm heat rounds, string fire and Milan. And normal to the crew compartment, the hull is immune to Carl Gustav and RPG-7. As the vehicle progressed during the 70s, the shapes became slightly more angled in places and less boxy overall compared to the concept model. The first serious design work started at Vickers Defence Systems with the preliminary designs and specifications finished in 1977 and the drawings were ready in 1978, with the first prototype ready that year, and testing beginning in 1979, with the display model shown at Aldershot in June of that year. Trials with the British Army's ATDU team began shortly after, and although the Army showed little interest in purchasing it themselves, they saw it as a private venture aimed at the export market. The first prototype was ready by 1979, and the Mark III was aimed at nations that could not afford the top-end main battle tanks, but wanted a tank with more protection and survivability than found on the Vickers Mark III. Vickers felt that the Mark IV offered the most advanced firepower, protection and mobility relative to its weight and cost at the time. The later vehicle was designed to accept a wide range of modules to suit its clients, notably in gun options via a universal turret which was adaptable to several turret ring sizes for potential growth and was able to fit either the rifled 105mm L7 British gun, the L11 A5 120mm rifled gun, the French Geert CN120 F1 or the 120mm German Rheinmetall L44 120mm smoothbore gun 
firing a selection of rounds from APFSDS to HESH and HEAT depending on the gun fitted. Initially Vickers sought to break the project into two vehicles, the Valiant 1 and the Valiant 2, with the Mark 1s having 105mm guns and the Mark II the 120mm guns. However this was later dropped although two turrets were made. To make things easier, all guns could be changed via the front and did not require turret lifting to be undertaken. All ammunition was also kept below the turret ring, with 52 rounds of 120mm provided or 56 rounds of 105mm. Secondary firepower consisted of two 7.62mm machine guns, one mounted coaxially with the main armament and the other on top of the turret, which could be replaced by a 12.7mm heavy machine gun if required. Multi-barreled smoke dischargers were found on either side of each Valiant and it used a combination of Marconi Centaur solid state fire control systems, laser rangefinders, full panoramic day-night vision and optional thermal imaging software offering a high chance of first round accuracy on the move. The gunner's main sight was Coaxial the main gun and came with a Vickers L31 x 10 telescope incorporating a BNS YAG laser rangefinder which was standard with a ballistic reticule accepting computed aiming marks or weapon control systems. A muzzle reference system was incorporated to enable harmonization checks of the gunner's line of sight to the gun axis to be made at all angles of gun elevation. A solid state gun control and fire control computer system provided precision stabilization of the main armament and fire control. The commander had an SFIM VS58010 gyro stabilized panoramic times 10 and 3 magnification, also incorporating a YAG laser rangefinder. Primary and secondary stabilization for the gun was provided by a Philips US 9090 gyro stabilized panoramic thermal imager with monitors accepting computerized aiming marks of both the commander and gunner. A ring of periscopes around the commander's hatch provided all round vision and allowed push button target designation for the panoramic sight. The driver was equipped with a Badger night driving periscope for day night driving. During silent watch a thermal pointer could be set to monitor in a pre-arc. Any changes in the thermal picture detected by the system would then alert the crew. Vickers claimed that the Valiant was the first vehicle to integrate a stabilised thermal sight which could be used by the commander and gunner to acquire and attack targets. This system was fully linked to the fire control system including the ballistic computer. Although it's not clear from the literature whether it was the first Vickers tank to offer this or the first tank in the world but the former is more likely. Other improvements were listed for future growth. These include a more sophisticated fire control system for the Belgian Sabka and a Baron Strouden defence system SICAT along with a French M572 stabilised site as found on the AMX30. Power was originally to be provided by a General Motors Detroit Diesel 12V7 1TA engine delivering 900 brake horsepower but this was replaced quickly with a 12-cylinder V-formation, 4-stroke Rolls-Royce CV12 TCA turbocharged diesel engine, providing 1,000 brake horsepower, and both were tested. One MTU 872 engine and rank gearbox was optional. The Rolls-Royce engine was coupled to a fully automatic self-changing gear TN12 1000 gearbox with a fully automatic gear selection and override control with six forward and two reverse gears giving the 43-ton tank good cross-country mobility at 60 km an hour. The Valiant suspension was provided by a torsion bar system, incorporating the auxiliary torsion bars with hydraulic shock absorbers. Six double road wheels were provided and three return rollers. Hydrogenmatic suspension was also considered to be an optional extra if specifically required. The Valiant's driving controls were developed to minimise wear on automotive components and reduce driver fatigue. The vehicle used a handlebar control system linked to an electro-hydraulic steering system which used a twist grip throttle and a hand lever to operate the brakes with a thumb button for gear change. The system also had a hold button for the gear change to ensure that there was no sudden change in speed when engaging a target or to drop down a gear in anticipation of an obstacle. This system as well as the driver's seat could be fully adjusted for the driver to operate in an up or down position and should the turret cover the driver's hatch or he was blocked off he could escape via the fighting compartment. 
Each Mark IV was fully protected from a nuclear, biological and chemical attack and able to operate in contaminated areas. A bustle mounted four-stage filtration system and overpressure system by West Air Dynamics and a Type VI nuclear, biological and chemical system prevented harmful agents from being drawn into the vehicle. A Gravineer firewire detection system was also fitted to detect fires and automatically suppress them while making the crew aware. The Valiant prototype incorporated two features to reduce the risk of detection by infrared devices and thermal systems. The first was the reduction of its exhaust thermal signature by mixing the hot gas with cooling air before discharge, and the entire vehicle was coated in an infrared reflective paint. The Valiant was built with multiple communications options and radio equipment for different markets. As standard it used the Klansman series of sets while being tested with the British Army. However, provision was made for the installation of different known sets for prospective buyers. There were also three variants proposed. These included a Valiant Armoured Recovery Vehicle, a Valiant Armoured Bridge Layer, and a self-propelled gun, probably using the VSEL 155 GPT gun mount. So on to the fate of the Valiant. Despite looking good on paper, the Valiant was found to have had several serious and non-reversible faults during trials, during the evaluation with the Armour Trials and Development Unit. These were extensive in nature, and not just related to the aluminium skeleton as commonly touted, which, after hard cross-country performance, was found to be insufficient to support the steel toe at Wichobam, causing buckling and stress fractures to such a level that any production vehicle would need to be rebuilt from the ground up with a stronger and more expensive alloy. The other issues found were carefully listed. These included the rear lights on the track guards were not suitably mounted and would work loose and fall off. The aluminium gun crutch mounting would fracture and break. And the attachment points of the side packs were too weak and would bend and fall off even with the hollow boxes. The next area of concern was the driver's vision. Due to the Valiant's armour being mounted on a lower nose, a move rather uncharacteristic of British tanks, which normally focused on the maximum protection on the glassy, while the lower nose usually remained a notorious weak spot. This in turn gave the upper glassy plate a very gentle slope, which while increasing its ballistic properties, became a hindrance to the driver who could not clearly see within the arc to the front of the tank in either a vertical or horizontal axis. It was also found that when the vehicle had its chob and packs fitted, several key features could not be accessed. Notably, these included the fuel ports on either side, which in turn meant that in battle, nearly the entire turret armour package would need to be unbolted and removed before the vehicle could be refilled and then move off again. Despite its obvious flaws, the Mark IV was held onto for a while and underwent several changes both in the armour layout and its design with several modifications made to the turret over the years, giving several different looking examples, but fundamentally it remained the same. The Mark IV remained in the UK for a while, however it was badly damaged after falling off a low loader and damaged its weak hull. The turret was relatively unscathed and after a lick of paint was repurposed for another use, five and a half thousand miles away on the amazing Brazilian Osorio tank made by Ingessa, a move endorsed by the late great Richard Gorkowitz who was on the board for Vickers and had been visiting Engessa at the time. The turret was shipped down to South America, where Vickers rather cheekily took the original workbooks and after reshuffling the pages for the turret one, then rebranded it as a brand new turret designed for them, and a series of new workbooks, charging Engessa a premium price. Although itself an excellent design, the Osorio was hampered by political interference from the US, in its proposed deal with Saudi Arabia, which fell through, and no purchases were made, leaving the company to go bankrupt. The turret was then shipped back to the UK for a new vehicle, the Vickers Mark 7. Once again, the workbooks were reshuffled and rebranded as the Vickers Mark 7, and the UK would have been billed a second time had they actually chosen the Mark 7. The hull itself remained with the ATDU for a little while as a training vehicle and a curiosity. It was offered to Bobbington who didn't want it, and so it went back to Vickers where its parts were pilfered for the Vickers 3M, and was last seen under a tarpaulin on the Tyneside before being scrapped. Overall, the Mark IV was a somewhat cursed design. It offered some very good features on paper, but fundamental mistakes were made in design, including a woeful lack of materials testing. 
Had it been an MOD project, which is normally broken down into more stages, then it is possible that these would have been ironed out. But being an export vehicle, it was all hurried in far too fast, and the resulting changes were deemed too serious and costly to rebuild, and not enough interest had been shown to make it financially viable. The Mark IV remains an interesting vehicle, and a lesson on how not to do things. I've added all the extra data in the description for those that like that stuff. Well guys, I hope you liked this video. If you did, give it a like or a share. We're close to 2,000 subs and growing. It's 2021 now, so hopefully I can get back to some good old archive delving and keep bringing you fresh content resourced from source material. So until next time, toodle pip.